Electrostatics and Electric Circuits by La Leonandra de Vicente, MD, and Pre-Med Disciples. In this lecture, I'd like to discuss those two aforementioned topics, briefly touch on the electrochemistry aspect, that is the battery, all in order to be able to apply basic knowledge and basic science to the human body by viewing the nerve cell as an electric circuit and as a battery. So we'll get into electrostatics now, but we'll start first by, by going over the table. This table here is the summary of what we're, we're going to talk about today, and I, I like to get through it first, and then and then we'll see it again at the end of the uh, at the end of the statics lecture. This first term is Coulomb's law. Okay, it says the force exerted by a charge on another charge is equal to k big Q little q over r squared. It's also equal to q times e, or the charge times the electric field as the units of newtons. Okay, so by electric field, which is equal to k q over r squared, which is equal to newtons, we have the units of newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. All right, that's electric field now. These are vector quantities, by the way. Vector quantities. I forget to put it in sometimes. And we have the potential energy. That's U. It's equal to force times distance, like oh, like always, right? Work. And it's equal also equal to QED. Q times electric field times the distance between the charges. And that has units of joules. And we talk about voltage, which is the potential energy divided by the, the charge, or it's equal to the electric field times distance. And that has units of joules per coulomb or volts. Electric field is the general way to talk about force, all right? Force per unit charge. Voltage is the general way to talk about energy. Energy, potential energy per unit charge. And force and potential uh, potential energy are about specific charges. And you should come to appreciate what we mean by general way. You will after we go through the lecture, okay? Charge is an entity that defies definition, but we all have an intuitive idea of what charge is. We have all been shocked before. We've all touched the door and got shocked, right? So, but again, we don't have a formal definition for charge, all right? Opposite charges attract each other, like charges repel each other. Positive and negative are just a convention, okay, and simply signify that they are opposite of each other. But, you know, you could switch the name positive and negative with each charge, and it wouldn't make a difference, okay? It's just a convention. There's nothing special in terms of positive and negative that makes them positive and negative. They're just opposites. Right? We're not saying anything about the nature of these things. All right, so universal law of conservation of charge, okay? The universe has no net charge, okay? That's an important law to remember. Charge is quantized, okay? Meaning that any charge must be at least as large as a certain smallest possible unit. And that smallest possible unit is the electron unit, okay? One electron unit is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, okay? That's the charge of a proton or electron. Obviously, they have opposite signs. But that's the basic, that's the elementary unit, right? Elementary X electron unit. And now we can look at these formulas here. The for one on the left is Coulomb's law, okay? Uh, it says that the force exerted by a charge is equal to K, big Q, which is the larger charge, times little charge over R squared. And K is Coulomb's constant, which is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th. Of course, we want to make, it's really like 8.98, but this is the MCAT, so we're going to make that simplification. And we're also comparing it to the force of gravity here. You can note that for the force of gravity, it's equal to g big M little m over r squared. I hope you're seeing the similarity there. Again, this big M, okay, this is the big M, the big the big mass. So in this case, it'd be Earth, and this would be maybe us, okay? And that's the force of gravity. All right. So now we're making the the you know the correlation here, the um the similarities again. You can see the force of gravity here in blue, and the force of of the electrostatic force here in in red and notice that these charges these these forces by newton's third law are equal and opposite and by that i mean force cab is equal to force cba right we see this here force cab is equal to cba and that's equal to k qa qb over r squared and the force of gravity is same way gma gmb over r squared r is from the center of charge <clears throat> all right but notice all right we are making this 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 um, comparison, right? But note that electrostatic attraction is much stronger than gravitational attraction, right? So in real life, you know, we don't go flying towards each other like um, like uh, opposite charges do to each other, right? We don't go flying towards each other, and that just means that uh, gravity is much weaker than than electrostatic force. All right. Continue. Center of charge, okay. Center of charge is the point from which the charge generated by an object or system of objects can be considered to originate, right? For example, the charges on a hollow positively charged sphere like we have right here, made from conducting material, will repel 
each other so as to maximize the average distance between charges. That's why these things are spread out. That's why you don't find a distribution of them. You know, that's why they're not all right here, for example. They spread out to maximize the distance of each other. And and why do they do that? That's Coulomb's law. They repel each other. They repel each other. And until they find the optimal distance where there's the least amount of repulsion, they're not going to stop moving until they get there. Okay? And that's why that happened. And also notice that there, 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 does, there does not have to be charge at the center of charge. It's just like there, there doesn't have to be mass at the center of mass. Right? So this is the center of charge, although there's obviously no charge here. All the charge is on the outside. Same thing with this mass. This would be the center of mass as well, right? Because this is this is the mass and this is the center. It's a symmetrical center. All right. So I also have this equation for you at the bottom to calculate the center of mass for a multiple object system. I just figured it'd be good to include it. It would be chi or the center of mass would be equal to m1 times x1 plus m2 times x2 over m1 plus m2. That's how you calculate the center of mass. So I have an example for you, but before. Well, we can do the example first. Calculating the center of mass of a multiple object system. So I'll give you an example. You can pause and try to do this yourself. It's a really simple answer question. So the the equation. All right, here the this is what they gave us. We just drew it out. Okay, we drew a diagram, and we plugged in our numbers, and we found the center of mass to be right here, just from plugging in numbers. Okay. So let's go back to our fact. Uh, all right. So why don't we deal with this one first? So we're going to rub this balloon. <clears throat> We're going to pick up negative charges because the balloon likes to pick up negative charges. Notice that, one thing to notice, let me remove the wall. One thing to notice is that we're picking up negative charges. We're not picking up positive charges. Why? We're picking up valence electrons. The the atoms, the, the nucleus of the atoms are what's positive in an atom. All right? And those aren't moving. Those are stuck within the atom, which are which is stuck within the molecules that make up this sweater. So you're not picking those up, but you are picking up valence electrons. So that's why, by the way, that valence electrons are only picked up. <coughs> you should also notice that these aren't spreading out. Why aren't the negative charges spreading out? The reason is that they're so attracted to the sweater that they won't spread out. But if this sweater wasn't here, they would spread out on the balloon, okay? But since this sweater is here, they're all attracted to it. So that's one example. We have another example. So here's John Travolta. And uh, we're going to rub our feet on this on this rug. And we notice that we pick up negative charge when we do that, okay? And it spreads out. The negative charge is spread out. If you give it enough time, all these things will spread out. Again, because this is Coulomb's law. It's repulsing each other. But if you touch it to a ground or we touch it to a conducting material, guess what happens? Think shock. All right, so that's the second example, okay? We picked up the charges. They spread out. And if you pick up enough, well, they're going right through here because I'm connected to the conductor, but pick up enough, they all spread out throughout his body. Okay, and there's some of them are stuck down here because they're attracted to this now positively charged rug. Okay, but you see how some of them spread out. Back to, back to business here. So. The similarities between gravity and electricity stem from the fact that both mass and charge create fields. And a field is some type of distortion or condition in space that creates a force on a charge or mass if it's a gravitational field or a magnetic if it's a magnetic field. And any field can be represented by field lines or lines of force. So the same thing, line of force, field line, field line, line of force. Okay, look at these field lines. These positive charges emanate the field line, okay? The, the field lines. Uh, go away from positive charges and towards negative charges, as we see in these two figures, okay? Uh, positive, yeah, right. So, again, if you have a positive charge, you go the way from it, and it'll point towards a negative charge, okay? It's attracted to the negative charge, so that's how we represent the field lines, okay? So, the closer the lines, the closer the lines are together, the stronger the fields, okay? And lines of force never intersect, and that's going to be the basis for the understanding that you cannot be shocked within a sphere. There can be no electric field lines within a, a sphere of conducting material. Okay, again, that has ramifications, and the ramifications are some of the some of the things that you know is kind of counterintuitive, but you're going to see that it is the case because of this rule that electric field lines cannot cross each other. It cannot be pointed towards the same thing that it emanated from, the same type of charge it emanated from. But again, the closer the field lines are, the stronger the fields. So this place right here is much, this field is much stronger here than it is here. All right. Okay, so here's a, an example. Remember, well, not really an example. Remember, lines of force must begin on a positive charge 
and must end on a negative charge. Okay, so there is no electric field that may enter a spherical charge, and it would be impossible because then this positive charge would be emanating a field line that points to another positive charge, and that's an impossibility. That's not how field lines work. Why would a positive charge ever be attracted and point to another positive charge? That's not it's impossible. So that's why you can't do that. That's why, well, I'll let you wait to get to the example. And again, note the lack of field line within the sphere. So electric field is defined as electrostatic force per unit charge. It has units of newtons per coulomb. And uh, here's the equation. The electric field, its vector quantity, is equal to K times big Q over R squared. And G field is equal to GM big M over R squared. Again, this is the big charge and the big mass by convention. Okay. The big charge and the big mass by convention. So why do you think that is? Why do we use the big charge and the big mass? Well, if we use the little mass or the little charge, it really wouldn't be telling you anything. Because think about it like this. Let's look about G field. Imagine we use our mass for this field. So then... Uh, we would have no idea that this big hulking earth is about to pull us towards it, okay? You know, if we have no idea because then that big mass is going to take over the equation, right? So we want to use the big mass and then see, well, if I place myself within the gravitational field of the earth, what kind of force will I be feeling when, I, when I'm in there? Same thing for the charge. We use the big charge because we want to know if we put a little charge in there, if we put a little charge in there, what kind of force are we going to be feeling? What kind of force are we gonna feel? Again, and that's from the units newtons per coulomb. And again, if we use the little charge, just or the little mass, it just doesn't it doesn't tell us enough. It doesn't tell us really anything at all. All right, so I just want to show you another Colorado FET. Okay, so let's pop some charges in here to see some field lines. Okay, notice the positive charge emanates field lines from it. And uh, if we pop in another negative charge, all the field lines are gonna start pointing towards the negative charge. Okay. Again, emanate from the positive charge and then end on a negative charge. So what happens if I put another positive charge in there? You see how the field line shifted? The field line that no longer... And notice also that these field lines, okay, it may look like it's pointing at a positive charge, right? This is emanating from this positive charge, but it's not pointing, okay? It's not pointing at the other positive charge. It's not, okay? It's missing it. It's slightly missing it. And so, again, see this right here? It's slightly missing. It's not pointing at that positive charge. It can't point at the positive charge. It has to go around it. So you notice that the field lines now are going around the positive charge. It's in the middle there to the negative charge. So there's no real field line between the negative and the positive charge right in the middle anymore, right? Because this positive charge is blocking that. So the, the middle now is here. Those middle field lines, those really tight field lines, those are right here. This one can't do that because this positive charge is in the way. Okay, so I just want to show you guys that. All right. Electric potential energy. And again, notice the, the similarities here between G field and electric field. Electric potential energy. So to find the potential energy of a mass in, in Earth's gravitational field relative to some other position, we simply multiply this force by the displacement in the direction opposite of the field, MGH, right? This is, like, this is potential energy if we're talking about Earth and gravitational forces, right? Similarly, the potential energy u of a charge in an electric field is the force multiplied by the displacement, or d. It would be fd, and this is also equal to qed, which is also equal to KQR, kqq over r. Okay? Notice the lack of exponents in the denominator here, okay? This is not, this is not the inverse square law. There is, no den, there is no square here in the denominator. Don't get tricked by the mk and forget that. Again, uh, this is potential energy, right? I remember that potential energies, all potential energies, have some sort of distance associated with it, okay? Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Let's continue. So I have a question for you, and this is about electric field lines. If you are in a car during a thunderstorm, should you worry about being electrocuted? I'll give you a second to pause the video and answer the question. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, let me give you the answer. It's no. You don't have to worry. And the reason why you don't have to worry is think about it. If you were shocked... If you were shocked and you had these positive charges and you were shocked, okay, there couldn't be an electric field line that goes like that into the car. Why? Because it would land right on another positive charge. And that's an impossibility. So there will be no field line in the electric field in, in, inside the car, spherical conductor, and you won't get shocked. Okay? It's a hollow conductor. Alright. Okay, so voltage. Let's talk about voltage. But Let's first talk about gravity, right? Because we need to make this correlation now, this comparison rather. If we were talking gravity, 
If we wanted a function that would give us the potential of the field, independent of any mass, it would be GH. Multiplying any mass by GH gives the work done by the field in moving that mass. Similarly, voltage is the potential for work by an electric field in moving any charge from one point to another. Okay, so again, I, I want to make this clear. This is voltage, right? This is this is how much work would be done independent of any mass within a field. Okay, any mass within a field. So if you wanted to know the work done to get a, a mass in, in, in within this field, you just multiply this term by m, and then you get the work done. So it's independent of mass, okay? It's independent of mass. This is how much work you have to do regardless of whether you're heavyweight or lightweight. Okay, and then you multiply by the mass to find out how much work you actually have to do given your mass. The same thing here. This is independent of charge, okay? This is the work done regardless of charge, big charge, little charge. But then you find out how much charge you really need to do uh, if you have a charge within, within the field line of this guy here. So that, that's the idea, okay? It's joules per coulomb. It's how much work you have to do to get a charge to one place in, in the field lines. And it's equal to KQ over R. Also equal to E times D. And it's a scalar quantity, okay? So you don't have to consider vectors. You don't have to consider field line. Well, you do have to consider field line, but you don't have to consider vectors. You just add up independent independent um, voltages to get the V total, okay? And notice the, the unit similarity. This is joules per mass, joules per coulomb. Note, like the work done by gravity, the work done by electrostatic field is pathway independent. So this here is essentially just a repetition of what we just went to in terms of equipotential. So if you move some charge or some mass or some magnet in some field, be it electric, magnetic, or, or gravitational field, the path that you take really doesn't matter. What matters is the displacement in the direction either for or against the field in question. All right, so this is the direction of the field. So any movement that I use go this way, okay, or any movement that I do this way, that distance or that displacement that I get is going to be what I use to calculate the energy given off when I move that charge or that mass or that magnet within that field, okay? So notice, it's H or D. When you go to calculate the work or the energy, it's H or D, okay? You're not seeing, I'm not putting in whatever distance this is. We're not using that because, again, that the movement in this X direction, the work done or the energy given off is zero because that's equal to potential. The potential is not changing because the way we calculate the electric field is dependent on distance and charge. And obviously, you're not changing mass and you're not changing distance when you're moving left and right in this field. So that's that's essentially what I'm trying to show you here. And now we got our chart again. So I'll go through it. Force, Coulomb's law, okay. The force is exerted by a charge on another charge is equal to K, big Q, little q over R squared. It's also equal to Q times D, and that's units of Newtons. All right, electric field E is equal, equal to force over little q, which is also equal to K, big Q over R squared, and that has units of Newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. Okay, we have potential energy U is equal to force times distance, which is equal to QED, and that's equal to have the units of joules. And we have voltage, which is uh, potential energy divided by a little little q, which is also equal to electric field times distance. And they have the units of joules per coulomb or voltage. All right, again, electric field is the general way to talk about force, force per unit charge. Voltage is the general way to talk about energy, potential energy per unit charge. And force and potential energy of our specific charges. And I think you should appreciate what that means now, right? I think you should appreciate what that means now. I think you do. I hope you do. But if not, you'll have to review the lecture. And one more thing I want to talk about is this, this notion of equipotential surfaces. Okay? Within an electric field, movement perpendicular to the field does not change up, does not result in a change in potential. Just like a mass moving along the surface of the earth does not experience a change in gravitational potential. So think about it like this. Let's say this is the earth. If you're here at one position, this is you right here. And then you move, okay, you move here. Your gravitational potential energy hasn't changed, unless the depth of this has changed slightly. Then, uh, But otherwise, uh, considering, just assuming that the surface of the Earth is flat and we can go from one place to the other without a change in depth, your gravitational potential energy here hasn't changed because this R hasn't changed. This is the same thing here. These are equal potential lines. The voltage at any one of these points and, and the work is the same, okay? You haven't changed your distance from this point. Coulomb's law, right? This this, this so-called R, you haven't changed it. 
this R here, the same here, this R here. Yeah, I mean, I know you know that. So again, the voltage here is equal to the voltage here. V1, V2. All points on the equal potential surface are at the same voltage. That's all I'm trying to say here. Let's move on to one more thing. And that is this dipole with an electric field. A dipole in an electric field will tend to align itself along the field in an opposite orientation to the field. So let's let's deal with this. You already know, just from the way the electric field lines are pointing, which one's positive, which plate is positive, and which plate is negative. This is obviously the positive side, right? This is obviously the negative side because again, electric field lines will emanate from the positive point and 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 then end on a negative charge. Okay. So where how did this dipole move? What are the forces on the dipole? Alright, it'll go like that, and it'll go like that. It'll turn clockwise, right? And then it'll orient itself, and then it'll look like this. That. I know I'm a terrible drawer, but... Alright, so the opposite, uh, uh, opposite of what the electric field does. And that's because, Coulomb's Law, right? Uh, like, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. So that's why it does that. What's the net force on this, by the way? What's the net force on this on this dipole? And these should be connected. But what's the net force on this dipole? It's zero. So let me give you a quick review of what we talked about so far. Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. We talked about Coulomb's law, which is equal, to, which it says force exerted on a charge by another charge is k big Q little Q over R squared and we say that's analogous to the force of gravity which is equal to G big M little m over R squared okay we said those um, electric electrostatic attraction and force of gravity attractions are by Newton's third law equal and opposite we talked about center of charge and we talked about center of mass we said that the um, equation the calculated center of mass is m1 x1 plus m2 x2 over m1 plus m2 Okay, we said that there doesn't have to be mass at the center of mass, like there doesn't have to be mass at the charge, the center of charge. Okay, we talked about how um, a field is a distortion in space that creates a force on a charge or or mass or a magnet. Okay, and they can be presented by lines of force. We said that positive charge emanate lines of force and those lines of force then end on negative charges. Okay, we said lines of force never intersect and lines of force never point to the same type of charge, which it originally emanated from so that we said that that can that means that there can be no electric field line in a positive and in a spherical conductor okay then we talked about electric field we said that the equation to calculate the electric field is k q over r squared and that has units of newtons per coulomb and we said that's analogous to g big m over r squared or g field okay and again though the big mass by convention because it doesn't make sense to talk about the little mass in that way because it doesn't give you much information about what would happen if you put a charge in that field Okay, and we also talked about how we can calculate the um, force of force of Coulomb's law, and that's just Q times Z. All right. We also talked about electric potential energy. We said that should be U is equal to Q E D, which is also equal to K Q one Q two over R. And again, we said that it doesn't have that inverse square law like the other two that we talked about have. Okay, and that's analogous to the potential energy M G H or G big M little M over R. Okay, and um, we talked about voltage, which is E times D. It's a, it's essentially how bad the electron is going to get from one place to another. Okay, or the potential work. Okay, it has units of joules per coulomb. But I like to think of voltage as how bad the electron is going to get from one place to another. And that's analogous to the voltage of a field, which is GH. Okay, it has units of joules per mass. Okay. And we said electric field is the general way to talk about force, force per unit charge. Voltage is the general way to talk about energy, okay, potential energy per unit charge, and force potential energy about specific charges. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a trick to kind of memorize these. Not memorize them, but a way that you can know every single one of these without having to memorize it, all right? And the trick is the units. If you know the units, okay, then you know... Um, what each what what the equations for each one of these are okay, and it makes it much easier to work through problems if you just use the units So if you know the units for force, what are the units for force? Newtons, right? Newtons, okay What is the units for work? Joules, right? And you already know from your earlier physics courses that in order to get from force to work You need to multiply by displacement, right? 
So that means then, if you have this, if you know this, k big q little q of r squared, and you want to get to um, energy or work, which is um, k big q little q over r, all you have to do is multiply by distance, which in this case is r. So if you multiply by by r here, or distance, you're going to get this equation. So you'll notice the r dropped out, and that's where it comes from, because you're converting to work. All right? How about if you want to get to energy, the electric field, which is newtons per coulomb? You have to memorize that. But if you know that, then you know to get from force to electric field, all you have to do is divide by little q, coulombs, and then you get newtons per coulomb. Okay? How about voltage? Voltage, you have to remember, is joules per coulomb. Again, it's about specific charges, general charges, rather. And in order to get to this from this, you can remember that if, if you're talking about coulombs, all you have to multiply by R to get to work, to get to joules, and then you have to divide by Q to get to voltage, okay? So joules per coulomb. I, I, I hope you can see that relationship. It's a pretty simple relationship. So if you memorize this and you memorize the units for each one of these, which you should, otherwise you don't really understand what they are, um, then you can very easily navigate through problems. Because sometimes, you know, a problem will just give you a voltage and they'll give you maybe a force and ask you to find work and it will become very easy for you then if you know what these things are so do it this way memorize it this way practice doing problems this way don't even bother memorizing just memorize coulomb's law and then manipulate it by either multiplying by displacement or dividing by q charge to get to each one of these okay now i can move on to examples example one how much work is required to move a positively charged particle along the red 13 centimeter path shown if the electric field E is 10 newtons per coulomb and the charge is on the particle is 8 coulombs? All right, I'll give you a second to answer. I pause the, pause the question, pause the video and answer. Again, this question is very trivial if you remember what we talked about in terms of displacement within an electric field or gravitational field or whatever kind of field. Again, this pathway that it took doesn't matter. It's just a displacement within the direction either for or against the electric field that matters because, again, the way you calculate the electric field is dependent on distance and charge, nothing else. So if this is the, the origin of the field, okay, this is the positive part of the field and we're moving in this direction, then what we use to calculate the energy given off or the work is just going to be this distance right here. So it's going to be 9 centimeters. Then you just plug in right here, convert to different units, and you're good to go. Example 2. A positively charged particle starts at rest 25 centimeters from a second positively charged particle that is held stationary throughout the experiment. The first particle is released and accelerates away from the second particle. When the first particle has moved 25 centimeters, it has reached a velocity of 10 meters per second. What is the maximum velocity the first particle will reach? This is a tough question. It is tough. It's so hard. It's kind of confusing, but we'll go, we'll go through it together. So pause, try, and then we'll go it. Okay, so again, here is what we have in the beginning. We have this hold, okay? The, the particle is being held together at 25 centimeters away from each other, okay? Then, it moves. We release it, and it moves 25 centimeters away. So it doubled its distance. Well, if you double the distance, right? It's a question about conservation of energy, okay? If we double the distance, this is a potential energy equation. If we double the distance, we double R. If we double R, we have the potential energy. If we have the potential energy, if kinetic energy plus potential energy is going to be constant, right, conservation of energy, then the kinetic energy has now doubled. And at that double kinetic energy level, we have a velocity of 10 meters per second, right? Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, okay? So then we are, we're asked what the maximum velocity be. Well, the maximum velocity is going to be when the particle that infinity distance away, right? And we only have half the potential energy now, right? We only have half of it left. So if we have this jug, I like to think of this jug. Let's think of two jugs, okay? This is kinetic energy, and this is potential. Kinetic, kinetic, and this is going to be potential. If at first potential energy is full like this, if we half it, okay, we get rid of half, then it's going to look like this. And the kinetic energy is empty. Potential energy is now looking like this, and the kinetic energy is looking like this. Potential. Well, at, at infinity distance away, there's going to be no potential energy left. Essentially none. At infinity distance, right? Because this is infinity, this goes to zero. You, potential energy, if this is, if you divide by infinity, this is essentially zero. Right? 
So that means our drugs are gonna look like this. Our drugs are gonna look like this. Potential energy, kinetic energy. All the kinetic energy is gonna, is everything gonna be, all the energy is gonna be kinetic energy, okay? And essentially, because it looked like this before, we had half the we had half the potential energy, and now we have double the potential energy. What that's gonna do? It's gonna double the kinetic energy. We doubled the kinetic energy. Okay, we had this much here, and then we doubled it. We doubled it. So we multiply by two with the kinetic energy that we have at 10 meters per second. What's that? What did that do to the velocity term? Right, the mass hasn't changed. One half hasn't changed. So the only thing that's changing is the velocity. But it's squared. So we have to calculate what the velocity is, and the velocity, right? You have to square root the velocity to get it. So how do I get this number 1.4? How do I get 14 meters per second? I thought we were dealing with two. Well, I already told you in the MCAT mathematics video, if you're dealing with a proportion, you better rearrange for the variable you are looking for. In this case, we are looking for velocity. What put those people off is they probably think kinetic energy times two so that this should double. No, you have to rearrange for velocity. And when you do that, you get velocity is equal to the square root of two times the kinetic energy over m. This is not the same two with this m. This two was already in here from the one half. Okay, so now we're going to write our proportion. We're going to say velocity is proportional to kinetic energy because that's the only thing that's changing. Because again, mass isn't changing, and the one half isn't changing. All right. So then we double the kinetic energy. Okay. What's the square root of two? 1.4. So 1.4 is the number you multiply by to get the new number. It's 1.4 times 10 meters per second because that's what we had at this this before when we had half the kinetic energy, now that we doubled it, we have 14 meters per second at infinity distance away. Okay, example three. In the figure, points A, B, and C are the vertices of an equilateral, equilateral triangle with sides of lengths 10, 10 to negative five meters each. Okay, so this is 10 to negative five meters. And the uh, it's equilateral triangle, so. Point D is exactly between point B and C, while point E is at the same plane as is in the same plane as A, B, and C, and it's equidistant to them. So these distances are all the same, even though I might not have drawn it that way. These, this this distance here is the same as this distance here, even though I may not have drawn it that way. Positive charge of the magnitude Q equal 1.1 times 10 to the negative 15 coulomb is located at points A, B, and C. So we have a charge here. We have a charge here at A. We have a charge here at C. And that's equal to 1.1 times negative 15 coulombs. So let's go through the questions. Q1, what is the direction of the electric field at point D? Well, that's why we did that FET, right? This is positive charge, right? So this thing is emanating like this. All these things are emanating charges. And that's pointing at point D. That's pointing at point D. And that's pointing at point D. Well, they're equal charges, so these two cancel. These two will cancel each other out. And so it's pointing down the page. Q2. What is the magnitude of the electric field at point E? Let me clear the ink. What is the magnitude of the electric field at point E? Well, some of, you know, I bet you guys don't know this. This is like essentially why um, trigonal planar geometry molecules um, are not polar. Things like trichlorides, all right? Okay, so these are electric field lines. I bet you guys don't know this either. It's going to be interesting. So watch this. So from this, you, you it's really kind of hard to see that these are going to be cancel each other out. But let's draw component vectors. So this is the vector for the B, right? Component vector. Component vector. Component vector. These cancel each other out. These cancel each other out. Um, these, t the both of these together cancel this one out. And if you don't believe me, try to do uh, trigonal. Um, not trigonal plane. Um, use uh, Sokotoa to determine these values. Okay, but I'm telling you, these things cancel out. The vectors cancel out. So what's it has zero magnitude. That's it's, the answer is D. Okay, moving charge. A force called the electric force exists between charges. If charges are experiencing potential differences, charges move from a higher areas of higher potential to areas of lower potential. Okay, again, this this is this notion of voltage, right? Uh, potential difference, voltage. 
is said to produce a flow of charge or current. And you can think of charge flow as analogous to fluid flow. I know we haven't talked about fluid flow yet, but I'm going to draw the analogy. Conductivity. Conductivity is when a charge moves along an object, and that object is said to be conducting electricity. But at the same time, it is resisting the movement of movement of charge. I don't know why I put coverage. Charge. <laughs> they do so at varying degrees, but most conduct charge very well or very poorly. So that's why we call them conductors or resistors. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relative notion, right? A good conductor can still be called a, a resistor, it's just be a very bad resistor. But the conductors are good conductors, such as metals. And resistors are bad resistors, and they hold electrons tightly in place, such as diamonds or glass. So why do metals make good conductors? You should know this. You know this. Okay? The, uh, the fact of the matter is, if you know the atomic structure, then you know the answer to this question. And it's because of the electron shielding, okay? Um, the ex the um, transition metals have a shit ton of electron shielding, okay? They have a lot of shells, and those protect the valence electrons very much so. The electron, the valence electrons of the atom, the this of these metal ions, don't hold on to electrons very hard, okay? They, they're very loose. It's, it's a very loose attraction force, okay? Because of all the electron shielding on the positively charged nucleus, okay? The Z effective is very low for these valence electrons, and so they're able to move from atom to atom, atom to atom. And that there's it's essentially like a sea of electrons moving from atom to atom. So the electrons here can jump to this atom very smoothly, very easily because the attractive force is very weak. Okay, and so that's what makes them good conductors. They hold on to electrons very loosely, and that comes from the structure of the atom. Knowing knowing about Z effective and knowing about electron shielding, that these inner shells are shielding the positive charge of the nucleus uh, on the from the valence electrons. Understanding that lets you know why it's a good conductor. Okay, bad conductor, uh, differential reason, right? Well, pol polarity of reasons, I guess you can say. All right. Since charge moves easily through a conductor, if an object is made of a conducting material, it can only hold excess charge on its surface. The excess, excess charge tries to maximize their average distance from each other, from other charges, and so they end up only on the surface, okay? Because that's how you maximize the distance between the charges, all right? Coulomb's law. That's what they want to do. They want to minimize this, this energy that they, that they'd be generated had they been closer to each other. So, like the field inside a uniformly charged sphere, the electric field inside a charged conductor is zero. So let me make it very clear what I mean. I'm talking about static electricity right now. I know where I'm moving towards, but I'm talking about static electricity. I'm saying that if you have static electricity on this on this pipe from, from the time that you ran current through it, right, and you stopped running current through it, and then you just have static electricity on the pipe, it's charged, it has some charge that was left over from the current, then they're all going to be on the surface. They're all going to move. Maybe for a millisecond they'll be inside, but they're all going to move to the surface, right? We saw the John Travolta in the in the uh, the, the Colorado FET we looked at. They all move to the surface. They all spread out. So the electric field within the charged conductor pipe is going to be zero if it has excess charge on it. So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Give me a second. I'll go with my pen. I'm not saying that. You can't have charge moving through here because you can. You can't have charge through the middle. The charge can move here. It can go like this inside the pipe. Okay, but once that once that current dissipates, once you stop running the battery, okay, and that, and current stops flowing through that pipe, then okay, then at that point um, you're going to be doing static electricity, and then there's going to be no electric field within the pipe. But there will be an electric field when you have current running through it, obviously, because you have current as this charge within the pipe, and obviously you have to force that occur. You have to put an energy in the form of a battery to make that happen. Or you just have to have a potential difference, right? But I mean, the battery provides the potential difference in this case. But you just have to have some type of potential difference to get that current to run through and do that. Current. Current is moving charge, symbolized by I, which has units of coulombs per second. The convention is that positive charge is moving is current, which is opposite the electron flow. Okay. The convention, again, is, is the and that's from Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin set that convention. So you could thank him for that, but you know it's not it's not completely out of line. I mean, obviously in a, in an electric circuit, the the what's moving is the electrons, but you know in active potentials, what's moving is well electrons are moving too, but what's really moving, what's really the current, is the sodium ion and the potassium ion. Okay, those are current. Those are moving charges. Those are currents. So the currents moving through the channel. The flow of electron resembles the flow of fluid. Okay. Like molecules of moving fluid, electrons move fast, very fast in random directions, 
whether the much slower uniform translational movement called drift speed opposite the direction of current. So let's think about electrons. We have a bunch of, so let's say we have a bunch of electrons here. I'm just gonna draw a few, just gonna draw a few. And they're moving, all, let's say these guys are all moving in this direction, okay? And the current is obviously moving in the opposite direction because current is positive charge. But the electrons are moving this way. There are some electrons that are moving in a uniform fashion, right? And they're, they're more likely to be in the middle of the, of the tube that are moving in a uniform fashion. Just like fluid flow, the, the ones that are moving in a uniform fashion, the fastest is going to be the ones in the middle of the tube. And on the outside of the tube and some on the inside, they have some random drift velocity, okay? They're just... Um, Sorry, that's not drift velocity. That's that's just random. That's random kinetic motion. Just the drift velocity is actually this way. But there's some electrons that are moving like this. Okay, they're just moving in random directions, moving into the pipe, moving in this way. All right. Okay. So I just wanted to make that notion there. That that's what I mean when I'm talking about can the random kinetic motion and uniform drift motion. And fluid flow the same way, right? Fluid flow, there's more kinetic in it. There's some fluids going like this, and there's some fluids, water molecules going like that in the uniform fashion. Anyway, let's let's focus here. Circuit elements. Well, uh, circuit elements, right? So uh, resistance is equal to rho times length over area, and has units of ohms. Okay, and resistance of fluids. This is the equation. Is the analogous equation is equal to eight eta l over pi r to the fourth power. Again, resistance of fluid, and you notice that they have the same terms. Length on top, length on top. A essentially area, you know, radii, and area, which is pi r squared, right? So it's all about radius. And they they react the same way. You increase the resi If you increase the area, you decrease resistance of the electricity. And in the fluids, if you increase the area, you uh, decrease the, radi the resistance for fluids. Okay. Ohm's law. Ohm's law is equal to... Well, but just as fluid will only flow in the presence of a pressure difference, charges will only flow in the presence of a potential difference. In a circuit, a cyclical pathway for moving charge, a battery provides the potential difference needed to maintain charge flow. Like fluids flow, like flowing fluids, flowing charges encounter resistance. And here are the equations, right? We already talked about them, and we could also talk about Ohm's law, which is delta v is equal to flow times the distance of flow, and that's you compare that to delta P, which is equal to flow times the distance of flow. Um, I is equal to uh, current, and R is equal to distance of flow. And again, again, just like water will only move, or fluid will only move down a pressure gradient, electrons will only move down a voltage gradient, okay? A gradient now, the gradients. Gradients are all over the place, man. But okay, let's go to the Colorado FET. All right, a resistance for a wire, right? We have rho. That's the resistivity. That's just uh, a that's just inherent in the in the material that's made from the wire, right? Uh, you can you can estimate that the resistivity for for metals are going to be lower than the resistivity for other non-metals, right? And we have length and area. So what happens when we increase resistivity? Okay, All right, resistance increases. That's pretty simple. Length increase length, the resistance increases, right? And we increase area, the resistance decreases, right? So if the, so if you want lower resistance, you want this really big, short, really really large area pipe, a very short length. Okay, that'll decrease resistance. Okay, if you de and if you decrease the area, right, resistance gets so huge. But okay. Okay, and here is Ohm's law. Okay, again, very simple. If we increase, so notice, right? We can add batteries, right, and that'll increase the current going through the system, going through the circuit, right? And if we have Okay, let's say we have three batteries in there, or three, three and a half, whatever. If we increase your distance, the current flowing through the system is going to decrease. And normally, this is the case. Normally, we change the resistance. The voltage is constant because we don't add batteries to a circuit, and we change the resistance. We increase the resistance, and the current decreases. We decrease the resistance, and the current output increases. Okay, normally, we don't change the battery, the, the voltage of the battery. So normally, that's the relationship. Increase the distance, decrease current output. Decrease resistance, increase current output from the battery. Okay, keep that in mind. Again, now we now we're talking about resistance again in terms of the circuits, right? So if you have circuits in series and you want to simplify it to get the effective resistance, right? You just for circuits in series you just add them R1 plus R2 plus R3. All right, and that's the effective resistance. If you have them in parallel, if you have them in parallel, um, 
And wait, before we continue, in theory, the current going through the resistance in series is equal for each resistance. Just think about it. Just think about it. There's no other place for the current to go. The current has to be equal going through this through resistance in series because there's no other place for it to go. Okay, resistors in parallel. So to find the effective resistance for resistors in parallel, it's 1 over R effective is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. Don't make the mistake of just flipping this. You can't just flip all these. That's not the same thing, <laughs> okay? You have to do all this math first, and then you can flip it, okay? You have to add all these first. The voltage across each resistor in parallel is equal for each resistor. Why isn't the current equal? Why isn't the current equal? The voltage for these aren't equal, by the way. But why isn't the current equal? Well, the current has other places to go. When the current comes through this here, it can go, once it gets to this node here, it can go here, or it can go here. So that's why the current's not equal, but the voltage is equal across the drop. The voltage drop is equal for each of these. Okay, that's just a rule you have to know. But it makes sense, right, after the context of what I just told you. And we have these equations up here again to remind you. Okay, so now we're going to go through a battery, right? You can think of current as flow through a constant diameter pipe and voltage as the difference in height between the po points in two pipes. A negative voltage would be uphill and a positive voltage would be down here. More water flows through a thick hose, likewise, more electricity flows through a thick conductor. And that's what we talked about earlier with those conductors, right? You want a, you want a big, fat pipe that's very short. Okay. A battery adds energy to a circuit. In our analogy to fluids, a battery pumps the fluid to a greater height. Batteries are rated by EMF, or electromotive force, which is, an which is an old name for voltage, essentially voltage. And how do you remember whether or not a voltage... Are most batteries positive or negative? Do most batteries have a positive voltage or a negative voltage? All right, we said a positive voltage is downhill. Okay, so it's essentially, it's giving, the, it's giving the circuit energy. If we're talking about gravity, it's like giving us a hill that we can just run down. It's giving us the energy. So to, how do you remember this? Is that How do you remember that a positive voltage is downhill is the fact that you've never seen a battery that has a negative voltage on it? Okay? You've never seen one because they, they don't sell those, okay? <laughs> You'd have to put in work to make the battery useful. But anyway. While real batteries have an internal resistance, it can be ignored unless otherwise indicated. To account for internal resistance of a battery, simply redraw the battery and place a resistor with a resistance equal to the internal resistance directly behind or in front of the battery. This is the battery, by the way, this picture. Okay, it's a galvanic cell. When you see a battery in a circuit, Picture the inside of a battery. A battery generates the flow of electric energy in a circuit from its built-in potential difference. Charges flow downhill from higher potential to lower potential. Batteries and electrons flow the other way, by the way. Um, batteries consist of one or more galvanic cells, which oxidation occurs at the anode, right? And reduction occurs at the cathode. Okay, so what? which one's which? Which one's which? Oxidation, red cat, and ox. Reduction occurs at the cathode. Anode, the anode undergoes oxidation. Oxidation is loss of electrons. So this is the anode. Okay, it also tells you, but this is the anode. Notice, this zinc has, first it's normal zinc, and then it come, becomes zinc 2 plus, and it loses its electron. Then these electrons travel through this circuit, and they get tested by the voltmeter, and then hit the cathode. And then the cathode takes on the electrons and forms copper. So this copper in solution forms this copper, and that's why it looks like this. That's why the zinc is getting deteriorated and the copper is forming more copper. Okay, and that's how a battery works. Okay, you would put, you would plug maybe a light bulb in here and it would charge the light bulb. It would make the light bulb work. And again, notice that these are separated because if these were not separated, if these were just in the same solution, it would just happen right here and no electrons would go through this wire. Okay, because electrons travel the path of least resistance. There's less resistance here than up through here. Okay. Ionization energy, how easily an electron can be removed from an atom, determines the potential or voltage of a material. Higher reduction potential is more easily reduced, lower reduction potential is more easily oxidized. Okay. Again, there's another reason why you should understand atomic trends and, sorry, periodic trends and the reason why they are there. So I'm going to review the periodic trends with you very quickly. Um, it's good because you should know that, but remember that all these periodic trends really are just dependent on z-effective and distance from the nucleus. And really, distance from the nucleus is dependent on z-effective. So z-effective works like this. As we move from left to right on the periodic table, we're adding protons and electrons, but we're really not changing the, we're not changing the principal quantum number. And so that means that because electrons are not very good at shielding neighboring electrons that are within the same principal quantum number, z-effective is increasing as we move from left to right. But as we move from top to bottom, 
we are adding a we're adding a bunch of protons and electrons, but we're also adding a bunch of shielding um, and principal quantum number n shells. Okay, we're adding a bunch of inner shells. And so as we move from left from top to bottom, z effective is actually de decreasing because the shielding is just so great and so big between all these inner shells that these outer valence electrons do not feel that 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 positive the z effective for those of outer electrons are very low. And so that means the atoms are getting bigger as we move from, from top to bottom, and the atoms are getting smaller as we move from left to right, all dependent on the effective, right? Um, ionization energy. So ionization energy is the energy that is required to remove an electron from an atom. Well, if the effective is, is um, decreasing from top to bottom, that means the attractive force between the nucleus and the outer electrons is decreasing. That means it should be a lot easier to remove an electron from, from, an, from an atom that is of that sort. So that's why ionization energy increases as we move from the bottom to the top, right? From 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 the bottom here to the to the right, up and to the right. And why that? Why the ionization in, increasing to the right? Again, the effective, the effective is increasing from left to right. So ionization should increase from left to right because of that attractive force. Electronegativity increases up and to the right. Why is that? Same reason. Z effective. Think about Z effective. I'm not going to go through the, the, the thing again, the, the rationale again, because I don't want to waste too much time here, but think of Z effective. And electron affinity becomes less, becomes less negative, well, it becomes more negative up and to the right. And electron affinity is the amount of energy required to, to um, add an electron to an atom. And it can be positive or negative, and that's because it could take energy to add an electron to an atom, or it can cause for a release of energy. If you have a very negative electron affinity, that means that there's a huge release of energy uh, when you add that uh, electron because it becomes more stable. So oxygen probably had a, a has a very negative electron affinity because well, well, we know the trend, but also because think of it, it wants to form this noble gas configuration, so it likes to take on two electrons. So back to the battery, all right? We talked about ionization increases up and to the right, and that's dependent on the effective, right? So if we compare K plus and chlorine, which one's going to be the anode and which one's going to be cathode? Red cat and ox. That's the mnemonic. Red reduction occurs at the cathode, at the anode, oxidation occurs. So reduction occurs at the cathode. The reduction is gaining of electrons. Chlorine then is going to act as a reductant, right? Because we know the periodic trend, we know the effective. It's more likely to act as a reductant. It's supposed to gain electrons. And potassium then is, is more likely to act as the um, anode. It's going to, um, red cat and ox, it's going to be oxidized and lose an electron. And again, that's all up to depend on the effect and forming that noble gas configuration, which is stable. These valencies are dependent and are determined by, the chemistry of these, of these elements are determined by their electron configuration and how close or far away they are from achieving a noble gas configuration. That's why K plus always form, potassium always tends to form K, sodium always K plus, sodium always tends to form sodium plus, magnesium 2 plus, right, Al aluminum 3 plus, okay, chlorine minus, fluorine minus, um, N negative 3, right, carbon plus 4, sulfur may sometimes form negative 2, sometimes form plus 6, right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, lose 6 electrons, form a noble gas configuration, sulfur gain 2 electrons, form a noble gas configuration, fluorine lose, gain 1 electron, form a noble gas configuration, potassium lose 1 electron, form a noble gas configuration, right? If you know that, then you'll, you'll always be able to determine with some pretty decent accuracy what's going to act as an anode and what's going to act as a cathode. In physics, current is defined as the flow of positive charge, not the flow of electrons. The direction of the current in the wire is from a cathode to anode, right? And that's the opposite of the flow of electrons. So electrons flow from anode to cathode. Cathode flows from, I mean, uh, positive charge flows from cathode to anode. The way I remember this is this. So we have the mnemonic red cat anox. Reduction occurs at the cathode and the anode oxidation. That means the anode is giving up electrons, and those electrons are then traveling towards the cathode. Well. If electrons are traveling towards anywhere, that somewhere, that anywhere, better have a positive charge associated with it if it's going to happen spontaneously. And so that's how I remember that the cathode in a, in a galvanical voltaic cell has a positive charge and the anode has a negative charge. What happens is in an electrolytic cell or a non-spontaneous cell, the charges are swapped. Electrons still travel from anode to cathode because the red cat anox stands for any type of battery, whether galvanic or electrolytic. So the charges swap, but the, the electrons still travel from anode to cathode. So how do I remember that? Again, if electrons are going to travel from anode to cathode, right, and the cathode then has a negative charge, that's only going to that's going to happen non spontaneous. So we're going to have to put in energy to force electrons to travel toward the negative charge because again, by Coulomb's law, uh, 
charge the charges was like particles repel each other so electrons are not going to spontaneously travel toward the negative charge on their own we're gonna have to put in energy energy to do that and that's why electrolytic cell cathode has a negative charge associated with it because we're forcing not necessarily because of, that's not why but again electrons will not travel toward a negative cathode on its own it's gonna have to be forced to do that and so that's how I remember where uh, electrons are traveling to. And then I just remember that current is the opposite because current is the flow of positive charge. And it's really for the same reason. You can look at current and do that the same way. So again, current is the movement of positive charge. And then that means they'd be moving this way. Okay. Voltage is the potential is also voltage, also called potential, is a way of expressing potential energy per unit charge, like we talked about earlier. It's a, re it's a representation of how bad the electrons want to get from one place to another. This energy is determined by the difference between the reduction potentials of the specific pairs of reduction oxidation reactions that occur inside the battery. A battery's energy is calculated using the equation delta G, chain of Gibbs free energy, is equal to negative F E. F is Faraday's constant. E is the uh, voltage of the cell. E cell is the maximum potential, redox, maximum potential of the redox reaction. For a battery to do useful spontaneous work, E cell must be positive and change to G must be negative. This is just a quick review of batteries, by the way. We have a whole lecture on batteries. I'm just giving you a synopsis like I told you I like to do. So and I just want to mention why this salt bridge is here. This salt bridge is here because if we kept running this reaction, we'd get all this zinc, this positive zinc in this reaction mix, and there'd be so much positive reactions here that the electrons would no longer want to, chart, want to travel to the positive cathode and just travel to the positive zinc. And so the, the reaction would stop running if we didn't have the salt bridge to, to keep the electron neutrality of the, each water, each uh, solution. And the same thing here. We have these positively charged sodium ions um, reacting with these, negative, these negatively charged NO3 molecules, okay, in order to keep the, the solutions electro, electrically neutral so that the electrons will travel in the right direction. So the chemical energy of a battery is turned into electrical energy, which is then converted to the energy released by the device, i.e. light, sound, heat, etc. So we have an example here of, of an, an analogy to fluid flow. Here's an example. Each spinning wheel represents a resistor. So this resistor, this resistor, and this spinning wheel, this resistor. They resist the movement of fluid. Technically, the voltage should only drop across the resistance per ohm's law. So in my fluid circuit, the height of the fluid should change when the fluid goes through the resistor not right before it or right after it. Notice that the resistor spin using up energy. Anything attached to a circuit that uses energy also provides resistance and the only thing and only thing that provides resistance uses energy. Okay. So again, here's the we put in so this is us. Our the battery in this in this equation, I mean in this example, in this analogy, the voltage difference, the battery is us. We take this water, we put it in a bucket and we pour it through this pipe. Then this pipe, this is the circuit, the water goes through the circuit, and it hits a resistor. It hits a resistor, which is the spinning thing, and it, and then the voltage drops. Okay, how badly the, the water wants to get from here to here, it drops when we go through this resistor. Okay, so now, you know, before, if the, it was at this height, you know, the water really wants to get down here, but it wants to get down here a little bit less, because it has a little bit less energy now, right? Um, and then it's here, and now it goes down this resistor here. And again, the voltage dropped again, the height dropped, the voltage dropped. Okay, because it went through a resistor, and then it goes out through the water and into the kiddie pool. It go, it goes back into the battery at the different terminal, right? Because the, here the terminal and here the terminal. A uh, capacitor. A capacitor is used temporarily to store energy in a circuit. It stores it in the form of separated charge. In a parallel plate capacitor, two plates made from a conductive material are separated by a very small distance. So these are our two plates. And again, you know the charges on these plates because of the way the electric field lines are drawn. The separation of positive and negative charges creates an electric field that is constant everywhere between the plates. And the electric field is equal to this, e excuse me, this equation. 1 over K times the electric field from a capacitor is equal to 1 over K times Q over A epsilon naught. And K is not Coulomb's law, it's the dielectric constant. And this term, okay, epsilon naught, is, is equal to the permittivity of free space, which is equal to this term. You don't have to know this. You don't have to memorize this. Just there. Okay. Um, the Q is a charge on either plate. Note that E and Q are directly proportional. Thus, V and Q are also directly proportional. 
Okay, so the capacitance is equal to Q over V. Okay, capacitance is equal to Q over V, and capacitance is also equal to Ka epsilon naught over D. Uh, okay, so if we increase the distance between plates, we decrease capacitance. If we increase the area uh, that each plate covers, so this plate gets longer like this, plates get longer, increase the area, that surface area there. If we increase that area, then we increase capacitance. Okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, by definition, capacitance is the ability to store charge per unit voltage, okay? It has units of coulombs per volts, okay? In other words, something with a high capacity can store a lot of charge at a very low voltage, all right? In a parallel plate capacitor, the amount of charge that can be stored is directly proportional to the area of each plate. This is because the charge sits on the surface of the plate, right? So it's not about, if we increase this area here, that's not going to increase the capacitance of the plate because it's not facing this wall here. We're talking about this wall right here. This is the area, the surface area that's facing the other plate. If we increase that area, then we're going to increase the capacitance. And recall that voltage is defined by distance, okay? V is equal to E times D. The further the plates are separated, the greater the voltage and the lower the capacitance. Okay, cool, 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 cool. A capacitor's job is to store energy for generally quick use in the future. But it's really, really a source of irritation, which you're going to see. Um, it's really a source of irritation in most electronics because it just, it just causes, it slows everything down. Because you have to charge a capacitor before you can run a lot of current through a circuit. Because it has very little resistance, so all the, circuit, all, the, all the current goes through the capacitor first. The energy stored in any capacitor is equal to U is equal to 1 half QV or U is 1 half CV squared or is equal to 1 half Q squared over C. I like to remember just one of these because then you can just derive the rest from this equation right here. So the one I remember is this one, 1 half CV squared. I remember this one because you can see the V squared, all right, like with your eyes. I got that from Khan Academy. Okay. Dielectric refers to a substance between two plates plates of a capacitor, and it must be an insulator, otherwise it would just complete the circuit and discharge the plate. Okay, so in this in the in uh this is this is to calculate the K. This well this is the giving this is the con this is something that's given to you, and the, and to calculate the uh, energy of a capacitor electric field rather of a capacitor it's one over K Q over A epsilon naught, and there's nothing special about this. This is K. This is the dielectric constant. K okay, the dielectric constant. So that's what they're talking about when you're talking about a dielectric constant. It's just something that we put in here. Air the the dielectric. Um, you know, different types of insulators are dielectrics. Okay, but maybe something like diamond could be a dielectric if you wanted it to be. Um, so again, notice how notice where the electric field line they're pointing. So this is a positive plate. This is a negative plate. And notice how the dipoles orient themselves. We already talked about this. They orient themselves opposite the field line because that's that's Coulomb's law. Opposite forces attract each other. So this is going to be pointing as positive. And this increases then the amount of charge that can be held on each plate, right? Because they have an interaction, they have favorable interaction and that'll allow for more charge to come to the plate and interact with this, this dielectric dipole. And that increases the capacitance. And again, I want to make this clear, guys. This is not magic here, okay? And when you add a dielectric, you're adding a dipole. And a dipole is an atom or molecule with a differential distribution of charge with a positive end and a negative end. So when you add a dipole to the situation, you're adding favorable interaction between the dipole and the plate. This positively charged plate here is interacting with the negative portion of the dipole, and that's going to form a stable interaction, and that's going to allow for a more stable configuration, allow for more charge to be put on this plate. Because remember, now, when you're putting positive charge on a the plate, there's a, a repulsion effect between the positive charge on the plate, and they have to spread out amongst this plate. So when you add a negative dipole, then they can interact and be more stable and have more attractive forces to outweigh the positive of repulsion effects that would occur when you add more charge, okay? Again, Coulomb's Law. Understand Coulomb's Law, you understand all of this. Okay, right? So if you increase the dielectric constant by putting a better dielectric in there, you increase capacitance. Now, we're going to move on from capacitor. Well, we are and we're not going to move on from capacitor. We're going to talk about our analogy to fluid flow. Okay, so again, we talked about this is the battery. This is us, you know, us bringing the water from here. Well, let me use my laser pointer. It's us bringing the water from here to here. That's us, and that's the battery. And we put the water through here. Uh, there's no voltage drops yet. Um, well, this actually, oh, 
the voltage drop is right here but you know what happens first the water goes through here it goes through here it hits a voltage drop okay and this is our this is our equivalent circuit by the way it hits a voltage drop so it hits r1 and then it hits here and most of the current and most of the water will go through here and go through the capacitor first it'll go up and it'll fill this up this is already filled so this is a this is the circuit that has been on for a while if the circuit has been on for a while then the elect the current will go like this boom boom it'll skip that completely because it's already been fully charged and it'll go right through r2 and back but if it hasn't been on so if this wasn't filled the current would almost all of the current would go through the capacitor first and fill up the capacitor once the capacitor is filled uh a lot all the water and all the current will go through here this voltage drop or go through r2 and skip the capacitor from now on. so that's why they say that's why problems always tell you usually they'll say well the, the capacitor has been the circuit has been on for a while that means the capacitor has been charged that means this is charged and no water and no fluid is getting wasted going through here it's just going right there and what happens is this when we stop pouring fluid when we stop pouring water through here the capacitor discharges it discharges just like this, this capacitor here it discharges when we stop putting current through so you'll get that extra shock through there. You get that extra flow of current right through here. You get that extra flow of water right through here. Again, notice that it's G delta H. We talked about that earlier. That's equivalent to voltage. That's the equivalent to voltage. So voltage or G delta H, same thing, this Y axis. Here's charging. Here's the voltage. This is here's charging and then here's discharging. Here's how voltage is changing. All right, cool. And it's the capacitor, by the way. Okay, this is the charging of the capacitor, the voltage drop on the capacitor. But okay, okay, okay. So that's 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 the analogy. All right, note the pattern. This is putting everything together now. Um, notice when you put resistors in series, it's R1 plus R2 plus R3. Resistors in parallel, it's one over R effective is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3. Uh, now capacitors in series is one over C effective is equal to one over C1 plus one over C2 plus one over C3. And for capacitors in parallel, it's C effective is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. How do you remember that? It obviously, it's the opposite of resistors. You can remember it that way. But another way to remember it, and I think a better way to remember it, is that putting circuit elements in series is like increasing the length of the circuit element. And since um, so that's why resistance should increase when you put things in series, but when you put capacitors in series, it should decrease, right? Because if you increase that denominator there, the D there, you're going to decrease capacitance. And putting circuit elements in parallel is like increasing the width or area of that circuit element. So you put things in parallel for resistance, you that's going to increase the area and it's going to decrease resistance. But if you put the oh, capacitor in parallel, that's increasing the area and that's going to increase the capacitance, right? So that's how you remember it. That's how you remember that you're using the right equation. That's the pattern. So, so I really want to make this point. So let, let's look here on the left here. We have these two uh, circuit elements. One was two uh, capacitors in series, and one was two resistors in series. We said that when we put circuit elements in series, it's like increasing the length of that circuit element, right? So here's the visualization. Let me show you the visualization. There it is, right there. So when you put these bad boys resistors in series, it's like one big long resistor. And when you increase the length of a, of a resistor of a resistor material, you increase resistance because then now the electricity has to travel through more travel through more distance are on a resistive material and look, look, look at the visualization for the capacitor if you increase if you put capacitor in series like increasing the length of the circuit element so it increases the distance between the parallel plates of the capacitor okay that increases the distance between the attract that with which the charges have to interact with each other the positive charges here and the negative charges here that's going to decrease capacitance okay if you increase the distance you decrease the capacitance i gave you the rationalization but also just from the equation you increase the distance then you have to decrease capacitance. And now that's why they have these differential equations for, for finding the effective resistance or the effective capacitance, right? For this reason. Now let's move on to circuit elements in parallel. We said that when we put circuit elements in parallel, it's like increasing the width or the area of that circuit element. So we have these two circuit elements with the resistors in parallel and then this, the uh, capacitors in parallel. So let me give you the visualization. Okay, we've increased the width of this resistor. Now the electricity has to travel through a larger width um, of the through the resistor. If, they, if you have a larger width of your resistor of your of your resistors, you have increased the area and you've decreased resistance. You've decreased resistance because now there's more space for electricity to travel and doesn't have to bump into all this resistive material. Okay, and then the capacitor, 
you should visualize these capacitors in parallel as one huge capacitor with all this big increased surface area, right? If we increase the surface area of a capacitor, we increase capacitance. We increase, and the reason for that is now you have more surface area exposed for then the charges can then interact, the positive charges here can interact with the negative charges here on this place. And again, that's why we have the differential equations for finding resistor, finding circuit elements in parallel, right? For the resistor, this 1 over R effective is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, but for capacitance, it's C1 plus C2 plus C3. And the reason for that is this, what we just said. Putting circuit elements in parallel, like increasing the width or area of that circuit element, okay? And then we, what we said earlier, putting circuit elements in series is like increasing the length of that circuit element. If you think about, if you think about it this way, you'll never get a question wrong. And when you get questions about uh, things that you've never seen before, but that, that seem very similar to circuit elements, you can apply this to that situation and get the right answer. This is why you should use this method rather than just memorizing the formulas. I mean, you have to know the formulas anyway, but you should understand why the formulas are the way they are. All right, so meters. An ammeter measures current, and you should connect an ammeter in series, and where you connect that in series is going to determine then um, what current you're going to run. If you if you put an ammeter right here between the battery and the resistance element, all right, this thing is in series with this thing, so the current going through the ammeter is the same as the current going through the resistor, okay? But if you had like maybe another circuit element here, so you have something in parallel, and then you put it over here, so actually, but if you put the ammeter right here, okay, then it's going to measure the current going through here. And that's not the complete current, right? The complete current going through the battery is more than the current that you would measure right here. So, right, so where you put the ammeter matters. And the same thing is true for the volt meter, all right? The volt, and notice that the resistance for an ideal ammeter is zero. That is the case because you don't want to decrease the current that's going through the circuit, all right? This ammeter is not supposed to affect the circuit in any way. It's just supposed to measure the current going through it. And that's another reason why you don't put it in parallel. If you put it in parallel, then it's just going to it's gonna short circuit the ammeter, first off, because it's just going to provide a very low uh, resistance pathway for electricity to travel. So it's just going to skip the entire circuit. So voltmeter. Voltmeter measures potential difference, okay? And one connects the voltmeter in parallel. Potential, volt, volts, same thing. So you connect that bad boy in parallel. So you see here it's connected in parallel. Why do you connect the voltmeter in parallel? Well, we already told you that for for circuit elements connected in parallel to each other, the volt immediate the volts is the same. So you can then get an accurate measurement of the volts of uh, the voltage drop on this on this circuit element by putting a voltmeter in parallel with it. Okay, and again, where you put that voltmeter is going to determine what volts you're going to measure. And the resistance for an ideal voltmeter is close to but not equal to infinity. Why is that? The reason for that is that you don't want you don't want current. To be a lot of current to be traveling to the voltmeter. You only want a very tiny slither of current to travel through the voltmeter, and you want the rest of the current to go through the circuit element like it should. And the reason for that, is you need to get a measurement, so you need a tiny slither of it to get to the to the um, to the voltmeter. But majority, you just don't want to affect the circuit, so the so the resistance for that is close to infinity. And that means that a lot of uh, most of the charge uh, current is not going to go through the voltmeter; it's just going to go through the circuit. Just a little bit is going to go through the voltmeter. Okay, those are meters on the MCAT. So power is energy output per unit time, electric output, all right, per unit time. And that has units of watts or joules per second. Okay, nothing special about that, very simple. Um, again, you can calculate power by um, current times voltage, P equals IV, I like to remember the mnemonic PIV. That is the best one usually to use because no, under most conditions, what happens is um, the voltage is held constant, and then you increase or decrease current, right? So that's usually the best one to use because the voltage is usually constant, so you know if current increases, then power increases. But you may have noticed a conundrum, and if you didn't, well, we're about to go through it. Again, power is PIV, PIV, and then the rest of these here, the other power forms, you just get from Ohm's Law, which is V equals IR, right? So there's a conundrum here, and I want to show it to you. So let me, let me get my laser pointer. There's also a conundrum with finding the energy of a capacitor, of a parallel plate capacitor. So right, we can we can get these different equations from just plugging in from V equals IR or C equals Q over V, right? But the conundrum is this. The conundrum is this. Let's say I ask you, what happens to power if I increase current? Actually, what happens to power if I increase resistance? So if I increase resistance in this equation, power increases, right? But in this equation, if I increase resistance, Power decreases. So what's and again, what if I ask you the energy capacitor? What happens to the energy capacitor if I increase the charge on the capacitor? 
on this equation, it increases. Right? And on this equation, if you increase the charge, it decreases. Again, there's a conundrum here. What's the conundrum? So the reason why that it seemingly it seems like there's a conundrum here and there really isn't is the fact that you need to know what's being held constant. So if you're talking about power, let me let me erase the ink. If you're talking about power, and someone asks you what's the power, uh, what what happens to power if you increase uh, the current going through the circuit? Then you have to know what's being held constant. Is voltage being held constant, or is resistance being held constant? All right. So if resistance is being held constant, then you can safely say that the power increases if the current increases, All right? And you can safe safely say that if the voltage is being held constant, then if the voltage is being, and resistance increases, then power decreases. Okay. So again, you have to know what's being held constant. If you know what's being held constant, then you can you can choose which one of these formulas to use. Okay. Usually the voltage is being held constant, so it's it's usually safe to use this one, or, right? It's usually safe to use that one, and then plug in for whatever which one you need. But again, be careful, and th there's nothing magic about that. That is normal, right? You need to know what's being held constant to to, to make a decision about whether or not something's increasing or decreasing. Because again, let's pretend that both of these had had a value that can change. If I say uh, if from this equation that if current increases, power increases. I need to know that voltage is being held constant because voltage could be decreasing and I just don't know it, right? Voltage can decrease more than the current increases, and then that would make the power decrease. So yeah, and again, right? There's nothing magic about that. It's just the mathematics of it. So not a conundrum, guys. Just make sure what you know is being held constant. So this video is just going to give you a bunch of different uh, types of circuits that you might see. Okay, so. Uh, this first question, the question is, is it in parallel or is it in series? To find out if things are in parallel, you have to look as to whether or not the current is splits. If the current splits, that means these circuit elements are in parallel. So yes, these things are in parallel and you would just solve it by doing 1 over R is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Okay, so again, it's in parallel. Next question, how to proceed here. So this kind of looks confusing, right? Because, um, you know, it just it just looks confusing. It, it's not a, a normally drawn uh, circuit element and cir a circuit. So what you do here is um, you start at the last electrical split and then move backwards. So here, okay, so we start from the battery positive terminal and the electricity splits right here. Okay, we go this way and we go this way. But then it splits again right here. It splits right here. So we have to start here between 2 and 3. We solve for that. These are in parallel, so we just do 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 is equal to 1 over R23. And we find that, right? Did I do it somewhere? Yeah, so we do that. So we do that, we deal with that, and then once we do that, we then, these things are in parallel now, these two. These two guys are in parallel now, and then we solve that, and we have R123. Alright? So easy, simple. Just don't be, because that's the same thing as this, okay? That, this thing right here is the same thing as this. Same thing as going like this. Um, the same thing, it's just, it's just drawn weird. But it's the same thing. Okay, so let's continue. So the question is, is this circuit element, in, is this circuit in, in parallel or in series? Give you a second to think about it. And I want you to stop and think about these things. It's in series. Okay, there was no current split, right? Look, current goes like this, 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 this. I know it looks like it's in parallel, but it's not because the current did not split. If the current did not split, then these equations about things being in parallel don't matter. Even though it looks like it's in parallel, it's really in series. Don't be confused by that. Okay, it's, and we, if you see a split, that thing's in parallel. If it's not, if there's no split, it's not in parallel, it's in series. So how do you proceed here? I mean, this is very simple, right? Um, so we do how we always do. We watch the current, and we split here. So these things are in parallel. These circuit elements are in parallel. Actually, let's go to the next page. Again, again, you start at the last split, and then you move backwards. So again, you go like this. There's a split here. And then these things are in series. So you have to deal with the last thing, the last split, essentially. Oh, we also have it. Oh, this is the battery, right? And then we go back. So again, you deal with the last split. So you go like that. You convert it into R23, right? And then you convert it one more time. Now they're in parallel, so you solve for that. And then, you know, that's it. How do you proceed here? So now we actually have a capacitor in here. So this is an RC circuit, right? RC stands for resistance capacitor. How do we proceed? 
You assume the circuit has been on for a long time and then you ignore the capacitor. Why do we have to assume that? Because if, the, if it's been on for a long time, that means initially, right, if we just set this up, as we just put the battery in, we just connected everything, all, most of the current would be going to the capacitor because it provides very little resistance. Once the capacitor is charged, no more current goes that way. So what happens is this. Let's, let's get rid of that. What happens then is all the current goes like this. It goes to this resistor and it, go, it skips the capacitor because it's fully charged and goes here. And I know we talked about this in the lecture, right? And then what, if we were to remove the current and remove the battery, right? If we remove the battery, then the, current, then the capacitor would discharge and it would release current like this. Right? It would release current. So again, that's the idea. That's the idea. So again, you just ignore the capacitor, okay? Because otherwise we can't answer the question. So final question, did the current run in this circuit? And it does. The current does run in this circuit. Again, but only initially until the capacitor is charged, right? Because this capacitor, you can't pass current through this through the capacitor, right? This is air. You don't, you don't, that the resistance of air is almost infinity, right? You can't pass current through the air, not just pure air. No, you can't do that. So essentially, this circuit isn't complete. It just, the, initially, the current runs to, to charge the capacitor, right? But once the capacitor is charged, once the, the voltage drop across, the voltage on the capacitor equals the voltage of the battery, no more current's going to run. No more current's going to run. Because if, let's say this was 6 volts. Once this is 6 volts, right, this doesn't make sense anymore. Because again, you're supposed to be 6 volts and then 0 volts. How are you going to get 6 volts here and 0 volts here? How are you going to do that? That doesn't make sense, right? So again, It'll run initially, but then once you get to that that voltage drop, that voltage equal to each other, it's not going to run anymore. No more current's going to run. So I hope that was helpful for you. I try to think of all the different types of circuit elements you might see. There's other stuff that you might see that we haven't talked about yet because we're going to talk about it when we talk about the biology, like you know how to do these things in the human body. We're not going to go there yet, but we're going to go there in another lecture. All right. I wanted to include an example on how to deal with multiple batteries. So let's go with this example. Each battery is six voltage. Six volts. What is the voltage difference between point C and D? So how do you deal with this? Well, for one, you know, when you put things in series like that, if you put six two six volt batteries in series, then you'll know that you get twelve volt overall, right? So that that's I think that's intuitive and you kind of just know that. So you know for a fact then if we have four volts, I mean four batteries in series like this, and each battery is six volts, then at this positive terminal, at this positive terminal here. We have 24 volts. And at the negative terminal at the end of this circuit, we have zero volts, right? That's a convention we always do. Okay. So this has to make sense. This has to, each one of these little battery sy symbols needs to add up to six volts. Each one has to be six volts. It can't be more, it can't be less. So why don't we start at the end? If this is zero volts, this has to be six volts because this is a six volt battery right here. Again, then this little negative terminal must be 6 volts because again, there's nothing, there's no resistors here, there's nothing here to change the voltage. So this voltage here has to be this voltage here. Okay, so if that's 6 volts, then, you know, for a fact, for this to be a 6 volt battery, this has to be 12 volts. If that's 12 volts, again, this is just a, you know, this is a, a resistanceless wire, so, okay, it's an ideal wire, so there's no resistance here, so these have to be the same in terms of voltage. If that's 12 volts, then this has to be 18 volts. And if this, again, this is the wire that has no resistance, so the voltage doesn't change. That's 18 volts. This is a 6 volt wire as well, and that's how you deal with it. So then the voltage difference between point C and point D is going to be 24 minus 6 is equal to 18 volts. That's how you deal with that. Again, right, and maybe just in case you don't know this, well, this whole thing right here is 24 volts. Everything, everything here, right up to here is 24 volts. And then it goes undergo the voltage drop. I don't know what the resistance of this thing is. Drops a little bit. And then this might be, well, actually, I know what it is just from the mathematics of it. Well, actually, no, I don't. No, I don't. I can't tell from this. But, but then it goes another voltage drop here, and then it gets to zero volts. And then everything from here on forward is going to be zero volts. I mean, that's just because it have, it's anything that is resistanceless, the voltage is not going to change from any point on it to another. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right, three major concepts. The first, the electric field E, the general expression of force, force per unit charge, and voltage is the general expression of energy, energy per unit charge. 
Resistance is proportional to length over area, and capacitance is proportional to area over distance. If you think of resistance and capacitors in parallel as having increased width, so more capacitance and less resistance, and resistance and capacitors in series as having increased length or distance, more resistance and less capacitance. Static electricity describes the point charge and is like gravity. Current describes the moving charge and is like fluid flow. If you understand fluid flow, you understand current flow. You understand uh, gravity, you understand static electricity.